you would open your Bibles to Acts chapter 12. Continue there in just a moment. We were down around verse 12 or 13. We'll pick up there in just a moment. bow together and have a word of prayer as we start our class. Father in heaven, we're so thankful for another day. We're thankful for life itself and for all the blessings that you bestow upon us. But we're also, as we gather together, very mindful of the spiritual blessings we have in Christ Jesus. So many to, to even mention. But we're certainly thankful for consideration for us to be part of the kingdom for the salvation that come through the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ. We pray, Father, that you will continue to bless us and help us to walk in such a way that we'll always be faithful servants. We're mindful this morning, Father, of those who need our prayers, and we pray that you'll pour out upon them the blessings that they need. And we understand, Father, that thy will be done. And we know that you know all things, and you love us, and you will do those things that are right for us. We pray, Father, that you'll bless this congregation, help us in our endeavors, help us to always be mindful of what we need to be doing, help us to be workers in the kingdom. We pray, Father, that you'll bless us today as we worship, that we'll have our hearts and minds prepared to worship in a manner that will be pleasing to thee and bring honor and glory to thy name. We're so thankful for your son. We're so thankful that he loved us and gave himself up for us. Set us the example that we can follow. And intercedes for us at this very moment. Providing the entrance into the throne of God. That we might be able to approach thee through prayer. And know that our prayers are being considered. And that uh, you are looking out for our well-being. We pray, Father, that you will continue to be with this congregation. Help us to strive to do those things that we need to do. Help us to be the right influence in this community. Help us all to work hard so that we might obtain the goal of heaven. Continue with us through this day and through the days ahead. We ask it all in Christ's name. Amen. Acts chapter 12. We're about verse 12 or 13 or so. I want to go back and talk a little bit about where we are as we started this chapter what is happening what is going on that is concerning the people the those who are christians it's not anything really new uh, to an extent but there's some things going on that concern them what is that What's Herod doing? Persecuting the Christians, uh, and specifically, he's taken James, the brother of John, and killed him with the sword. Uh, now, when we know that it's James, the brother of John, who does that let us know who this is? If you go back and think about your, your apostles being selected, Jesus called them one by one. And he calls the sons of who? Zebedee. James and John. Now, what's the significance of James and John, uh, let's say, to Jesus? If you look in the scriptures and you look at what uh, happens on a number of occasions that Jesus sort of withdraws himself or is... Uh, mention is made of certain apostles whose names always usually come up. In fact, it's been referred to as maybe some of his closest apostles or maybe somewhat of a little inner circle that's going on within the apostles. Although I, I believe that Jesus was fair and out front with all the apostles, there just seem to be more writings about these three. Who are they? 
We've got two of them mentioned here in the first part of Acts. James, the brother of John. Who's the other one? Peter. Peter, James, and John. And uh, in the garden, as Jesus would go and pray, uh, as he prepared for the, his crucifixion, these were the three that went with him. And he asked them to stay awake and to be there to support him. And, of course, they fall asleep. Peter's always on the outskirts there, always staying around where Christ is, although he denies it. And James and John, the significance of James and John uh, are also highlighted in another passage where James and John's mother approached Christ with what request? That when he comes into the kingdom, what? They get what positions? Sit on the, sit on the right hand, sit on the left hand. And, and, and James even approaches closer and says, well, I believe it's James. I might not be right about this, but I think it's James. Approaches him and says, Jesus says, well, can you, can you suffer the things that I'm going to suffer? And James says, yeah, I can do that. And so there is a, a closeness here of those that are uh, here. And there's some significance to this. Um, who's the first apostle that dies? And we're not talking about Judas, obviously, because he took his own life. Who's, in Scripture, who's the first apostle that dies? A martyr's death. James. And then the significance of this is John's his brother. And who's the last apostle we know that would have died? John. It's just little interesting tidbits there. Now, when you think about what's happening here, the, the scholars will say that it has been about seven years and since Stephen's life was taken. Stephen was stoned by an angry crowd. And so when you think about those who are being persecuted and those that are, we're aware of that are actually killed, it's been about seven years since Stephen was, was stoned to death. <clears throat> so... It, it's not as if they weren't being persecuted, but it, it, it would seem to appear that at least in, the, in Jerusalem where things are going on, that uh, they haven't been um, exposed to other killings of those who are the, of the early church. And so now Herod rises up and wanting to please the Jews, he takes the life of James with the sword. Now when we talked about this, I, I think it's fairly accurate, uh, not having all knowledge and everything, not having been there, but Herod wanting to please the Jews is not going to go off into the back parts of the, the prison or dungeon or someplace in, in secret and, uh, and take the life of James and then just sort of let it leak out. As we look at the, the latter part of chapter 12, we're going to see the nature and character of Herod. And, uh, and so it doesn't seem to fit with him that Herod would not have uh, made this a public execution uh, with the Jews there consenting to the death of James and, and sort of agging it on. So that seems to be what's happening here. And, and so, it, hey, this, this came out real good. And, and if you've ever noticed how people are with things, uh, if you've never done something before, let's say somebody's going to do a... Uh, cook-off or some kind of contest if it goes well then the, the people who put it on usually say we're going to do this again it went off so well well that's sort of the way it happened here with Herod he, he executes James the Jews like what's going on and so let's do it again and so he takes Peter and uh, and he puts him in prison and we we left there last week where Peter as an angel appeared to him, he leads him out of the prison, right between guards, having chains fall off of him. It just seems uh, unbelievable. And he finds himself to the, to the main road of, the, of uh, the town there, and then he heads off to the, the house of Mary, the uh, mother of John. Now, what's the significance here of 
this John in verse 12. Who is this John? Verse 12. John, whose surname was Mark. Now, what's the significance of John Mark? What's fixing to happen here really soon? Missionary journeys. And uh, Paul and Barnabas, or, well, Saul and Barnabas, uh, still being called Saul at this point, they're going to go. They've been active in, in Antioch. They're going to come to Jerusalem. We're going to see that happen. Uh, they're going to get prepared to be sent out to the first missionary journey. And John Mark is going to go with them. And we're going to read a little bit later on about the fact that John Mark turned back. And then there's contention between Paul and Barnabas as they get ready to go on the next missionary journey because Barnabas wants to take John Mark with them again. And Paul, and Paul says, no, I don't want any part of that. And then we see the split that takes place. Paul takes Silas, and uh, Barnabas takes John Mark. And then we see later on in Scripture uh, the, the idea that this, you know, you can, you can come back from, from disappointment. You can come back from uh, having a bad first impression. John Mark later on is referred to in very uh, great terms in terms of Paul talking about him and how much he was a faithful servant, things of that nature. So, but these are some of the things that we pick up as we go through here. They're at the, these people are gathered at the house of Mary, the mother of John Mark. And uh, they're, they're gathered there. What are they doing? They're praying. And we talked about this uh, last week. Did we meet last week? We had so many speakers. I'm trying to remember when we did. I think we did. I'm, I'm a little confused. I think we were here last week, week before last we were. They're praying. And we see that uh, they are intently praying. They're constantly praying. Because this is a great thing that's happened. As I mentioned to you just a moment ago, from what we know from, from Scripture, and, and there could be other deaths that have taken place, but certainly not of the apostles who were the very foundation of the church in Jerusalem. And although Paul, as an apostle born out of due season, goes out and has participates in missionary journeys, we talked about that the remaining of the apostles stayed in Jerusalem. So here's the, the, the stronghold of the church in Jerusalem. And they're fighting persecution. They're fighting persecution. Uh, things that are coming their way. But apparently we don't see the kind of deaths taking place, at least not documented in Scripture, until here's James. Now this shakes them. You've got to understand, it shakes them just at the death of James, the death of an apostle. That's significant. This is the first apostle to be, to be martyred. And, and yet... As they are concerned about that and it, 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 it disturbs them, now Peter's taken. Now there's, you know, it's the, the same thing we said. You know, Herod thinks this pleases the Jews. It looks like it turns out well for, for him and his popularity among the Jews. So he takes Peter. Now Peter has always been outspoken apostle. Uh, many may have looked at him as somewhat in a little bit more of a leadership role or more active role than some of the other apostles. Uh, the scriptures seem to back that up with some of the things that go on. But uh, we don't know exactly what the other apostles did other than the fact that they were busy. They, they weren't sitting around while Peter's doing certain things. But there's not as much documented about others as it is about Peter and then certainly Paul. So here's Peter and as he's taken now and certainly the same fate it awaits him and that's it's no doubt that it that word leaks out that what Herod intends to do is to take Peter's life just as he's taken James so they're, they're concerned about this and they're praying and, and all this happens to Peter he's released from prison he goes to the house of Mary and he knocks on the door that's what we would think would, would happen the doors would probably shut up um, at, at this point in time and 
And so you wouldn't just go into somebody's house. He knocks on the door. And uh, verse 13, as Peter knocked on the door of the gate, a damsel came to hearken to him, uh, or to hearken, named Rhoda. Now, we don't know much about this young damsel, but we see how she reacts to what's going on. She apparently hears the knock. She, she asks, who is it that's there? She hears the voice of Peter, verse 14, and when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter uh, stood before the gate. Peter's outside the door. Uh, she knows Peter's voice. That means she has been involved with a lot of activities as the church you would imagine would have been active in the, what they're doing in Jerusalem. They know Peter's voice. They've heard Peter speak. They've heard Peter provide guidance. They know who Peter is. She hears Peter's voice and she's so excited that instead of opening the door, she runs in to tell everybody else. Now, this would be a typical reaction because what have they been doing for some time now? They're praying. Lord, don't let something happen to Peter like it's happened to James. Uh, provide him some uh, safety. Give him release from Herod. All these things that they're praying, that's, they've been working on that for some time. We mentioned this last week. We, we come together and our typical thing is, and this is not that it's wrong, but <clears throat> you, you question whether or not it's, it's adequate. Sometimes we come in here and we have a prayer maybe before we start a service and we have a prayer at the end of the service and that's the extent of our pray, praying. How many times do we come together and pray for a specific purpose for some period of time? We just don't typically do that. Now we may do it outside of the building, that's, that's fine. We may do it individually, but how many times we come together as a group like we see happening here and praying intently for something to happen? Now, if we were praying for something intently to happen, and then we heard that something positive had happened, as in the case of this individual, what would we be, be, uh, be doing? How would we react to that? She's happy. She's full of gladness. She's so excited, she didn't think about opening the door. She runs to tell the others. Now, given what's happened with James and the, the whole environment with Herod and what he's promoting with the, the, the Jews who hold on to Judaism, um, you can see some of the reaction that's going to happen here. So she, she goes in and tells them, and it says, and uh, she ran back and told them about it, how Peter stood before the gate. Now look at what they say to her. And they said to her, Thou art mad. You are mad. Now what would that imply here? If you say that somebody's mad, what kind of mind are they in? Their mind is, is gone crazy, hasn't it? You, you, you're just mad. You, you're out of your right mind. So there were some who were... <laughs> this is this is a good study because... Let's just think about it. Here's a group that's come together for the purpose of hoping that God's going to listen to their prayers and something very positive is going to come out of the imprisonment of Peter, right? Isn't that why you're praying? Why else would you come together to pray? Well, the group's getting together to pray. You know, I always try to get, get with them. I don't know if I agree with what they're talking about or what they're praying, but I'll get with them just because that's what they're doing. Somebody told her that you're mad. That tells me that whoever that was that was praying wasn't expecting too good of results, right? You're mad because you're telling me Peter's out. It couldn't be. There's no way. Herod's not going to let Peter go. Well, I understand that. He's not going to do that. But you've got to remember who's in the mix here, and that's always God. But that's a response she gets. Somebody's praying, I hope something good happens to Peter. Hey, something good's happened to Peter. You're mad. You're crazy. Sort of a revealing of some of the people's uh, belief about what they're doing there, praying. That some people believe that, that must be wasting their time. 
Because if something happens positive from their praying, this person told her she's mad. It can't be. There's no way Peter's out there. So that's one response again. But it says she confidently or constantly affirmed that it was even so. It is Peter. I know his voice. It is Peter standing outside the gate. And she was confident with that. And then they said what? It's his angel. If you think through the, the mentality of people, if people were saying that it was Peter's angel, what would that have said about Peter? He's dead. He's dead. It's not really Peter. It's Peter's angel. Now, they had heard about angels, and angels were part of their, their history and the delivering of messages and stuff, and angels would come from on occasions and, and provide a message from God. And so if it's Peter's voice and there's someone actually knocking on the door and she's confident and she's telling him, no, it's real, he's out there. Their conclusion is that Herod has done his deed and it's Peter's angel. And so that, that's another interesting response that's provided here. You have to wonder what Peter <laughs> is thinking. I know they're here. I, I, I knew they were here praying. I don't know how the message got to Peter. Maybe someone came to visit him and it was allowed. I don't know. Uh, somehow Peter knew that they were, they were there at Mary's house. And so, or at least he was going to go to Mary's house because that maybe was a safe haven. I don't know why he's going there, but he's knocking. And uh, it doesn't even appear that, that Rhoda responded to him, his voice. That she just ran off when she heard it. And said, Peter, Peter's here. So he continued to, continues to knock. He continues knocking. And uh, when they had opened the door, and apparently she convinced him enough to say, well, you know, let's go look and see who it is. Maybe it, you know, maybe it's his angel. We don't know. Let's go find out. See. So convinced them to go and they, they unlocked the door and they saw him and they were astonished. You look at these passages sometimes and you think these are people who have lived in Jerusalem. Now some of them may not have been born at the time that Christ was there doing his miracles in Jerusalem. Uh, but if it's only been seven years it, which is about A.D. 43 or 44. That, that the documented death of Herod, we're going to see later in the chapter, I believe is A.D. 44. So this was probably going on somewhere in the, in the time, the thinking is, somewhere around A.D. 43. And then they think that the, 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 the scholars would say that it would have be, been about seven years since Herod, I mean, since Stephen's death. So if I do the math, I think that was like 30 6 AD and the church was established in AD 33 according to the, the time markings that we are, are familiar with. Uh, so most of the people that were here were probably um, aware of what went on in Jerusalem. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the apostles, the establishment of the church, the things that have happened, the stoning of Stephen, they have seen not only, as we've read the passages from time to time in the early chapters of Acts, they have seen many marvelous works, many miracles, things that were hard to explain without the power of God, people being healed, people being raised from the dead. These things were known by these people, and yet when they see that Peter is unharmed by Herod, they're astonished. It's almost as if they're asking, how could this be? How is it possible that Peter stands before us unharmed? And you, you almost, it, it's like you're reading a book sometimes. And, and you're sort of watching how these people react. And you're saying, how could you be astonished? What is it that you've seen done at the hands of the apostles because of the power of God? 
How is it that you're astonished that Peter physically stands before you unharmed? And we read that book and we say, how, how are you people reacting this way? There seems to be a disadvantage, and I'll just mention this and we'll move on. There seems to be a disadvantage from us reading historical facts of the early church and maybe other passages. But we tend to say, how is it that you people don't believe in God? How is it that you don't react in different ways because of the power of God? Because we read these things and we say, the evidence is clear. And maybe there's things we just don't understand. We, there's things we don't understand about what's going on in these people's lives, what they're dealing with. We don't know what all they've been associated with. It just seems to us that these people ought to be saying, well, yeah, that's what we expected to happen. We're praying to God. We know the power of God. We've seen the miracles. We know God can do this. We're not astonished that Peter's released unharmed. Did it not just happen a few chapters earlier? Peter and John were locked up, and then they were let go. The earthquake, they were unharmed. Well, I guess that's a little bit later in it. I'm sorry. But uh, we know that they were locked up and unharmed, and let me put it that, that way. Um, but they, they've seen these things happen, but we have a tendency to think as we read Scripture and say, well, these people should not be astonished. And yet we don't know what goes on in their lives. And so we have to read that with um, at least a, a sort of a, a, a view that says we don't know everything. Because if we read it just straight value, we think, well, these people are silly. You know, they've seen the power. They've seen what's been done. How can they be astonished? They ought to have more faith. We can say those things, but we don't know and we didn't live their lives. But nonetheless, these people were astonished at the fact that Peter is standing outside the door. It's just hard sometimes for us to read the passages and to think they didn't have enough faith. But, you know, there are times in our lives that we, won't, we don't have enough faith. And we have things that are evidenced before us. You know, we'll worry about sometimes losing our job. What's going to happen to me? I'm just going to, I'm just going to, you know, dry up here and, and just go away because I don't have a job. And we don't think about it in terms that God has always provided for us. If you've never done this, I challenge you to do it. Go back over your life. Just take time to sit back and think about it. Some of the circumstances that you found yourself in, how did you get out of those when they were difficult? You're here today. I'm sure you have not come through this life unscathed. If you go back and look at certain circumstances that have happened in your life, you'll see how God has taken care of you. Now, you may not have riches. You may not have extreme wealth. But I guarantee you that if you go back and think about it, maybe it's been with your health, maybe it's been with other difficulties, maybe they didn't turn out exactly the way you wanted it to turn out, but you were taken care of. And we need to think about that because it's, it's there. It's, it's written in our minds if we just take the time to evaluate it. So here we find uh, Peter finally getting to talk to these people. Uh, apparently a bunch of clamoring going on. Everyone that's there is like, what, what's happening here? Is that? And you can imagine if you're standing at the door and not a, a big uh, passage into a house or people standing inside. Who is it? Is it really Peter? Uh, you know, what's going on out there? I can't see. So apparently there's a lot of, uh, you can imagine a lot of clamoring going on here. But it says he beckoned unto them with his, uh, with his hand to hold their peace. And please just calm down. And uh, he's going to explain to them what happened to him. Um, he declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he says, 
yet again, here is the power of God working in our lives. And it's just, it's an amazing thing. It is an amazing thing how that God is carrying out his will and establishment of his kingdom through mortal men. It's just an amazing thing. You, you keep in your mind, no doubt, you keep thinking, God does not need us. He, he doesn't need us to, uh, to be who he is. We, we don't supply him with, um, with things that sustain him. And yet he wants us to be a part of him. He wants us to be in a relationship with him. And the fact that, that through, the, through mortal weak men, he is able to carry out and do what he wants to do. Peter says, let me tell you what's happened here. God has done this, how he has delivered me from Herod. Now, if you think in terms of power, let's think in terms of, if you think in terms of the Jews and what we've been able to determine from Scripture is that although the Jews were underneath Roman rule and whatever, that apparently they were either some uh, soldiers assigned to the chief priest um, of, of the, the Jewish people that were allowed by the, the governors of the region or by, by the, the, those in power in Rome, whatever. We see where they have some soldiers apparently at their disposal. Uh, not an army, certainly, but they have some power. Herod is a great power. He is being allowed to, um, to rule by the Romans, but his, his direction is to keep the Jewish people uh, in control. Don't let them get out of control. It's your responsibility. And so here's Peter, who has no power physically in the sense that he has soldiers or an army to protect him. And yet God has delivered him from forces uh, that it's just unbelievable. Um, it's almost like someone being taken prisoner by a very strong uh, power and then all of a sudden they have found their way out of that without an army or anything to, to deliver them. And it's like, how in the world does this happen? So Peter declares to him the power of God. What happens? And what does he say at this point? He says in verse... 17, go show these things unto James and to the brethren. Go show these things. Now, if you're reading this at face value, you say, Herod takes James and kills him with the sword in the very first verse or so of chapter 12. And then we get to verse 17, and Peter says, okay, I've been released. Now go tell this to James and the brethren. And you say, oh, wait a minute, James is dead. Well, obviously... What? This is, a different, this is a different James, isn't it? And so scholars believe that this is James, the brother of Jesus, who in the very beginning was one who doubted who he was, and yet we know he comes, uh, becomes a, a very active part of the church and uh, there in Jerusalem. And he's going to be mentioned a little bit later on in the issue of circumcision. And then we know that he later on believed to have written the book of James. So he's active uh, in the church, and so he's somewhat of a leader there, uh, not an apostle, but active and a strong believer in doing those things. Peter says, go tell this to James and the brethren. Now, what's the purpose of this? Why would he say, go tell these things? Why wouldn't it just be, I'm glad I got out of this. Hope that doesn't happen again. Um, go tell James. And the brethren. The idea of the abilities that they had in the early days, and of course this was addressed by Paul, and um, as we see it in the in the church in Corinth, where people would have spiritual gifts and they say, "Look, what I can do, I can do this, I can do that." That wasn't the purpose of spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts were there to, to build the solid foundation for God being behind the kingdom, behind the truth of the gospel, and the purpose behind the death of his son 
If it was not that he came here and he died just like every other man, and so we forget about him, he, he arose from the dead, and he is the head of the church, the body. And so there's this very solid foundation that, that is the intent to continually bolster and build. And uh, it's one of those things that typically when you talk about building a house, for example, you don't build it by bringing in this, this huge structure and just dropping it into place. Typically, how do you build a foundation? If you've ever watched somebody building a house or, or anything else, how do they do it? It's little by little, brick by brick, block by block, some type of process of where things are built piece by piece until you have this solid foundation. Well, that's the idea here. There's a continual need for the church to hear of the power of God working in people's lives and how he is even ruler over the rulers and has power and dominion over them such that at God's will uh, these things can happen like they happened to Peter. So it's important for him to go tell the brethren to bolster them. They're sitting here at uh, some other location and what this points out to us <coughs> is as you look at the church in the early days, they didn't have a big building to come into and, and gather together. They usually probably gathered together in, in various locations because that's the best they could do. They, they would gather together in different locations because they just didn't have ability to assemble or it was too dangerous for them to assemble. So they would gather together in small little uh, pockets in different places and so James certainly was not part of those at the house of Mary and so he says go tell them about what's happened bolster the church wherever it is and try to make sure everyone's aware of the power of God and don't lose sight that God is the one who's making things happen yes James died and it's apparent here that God is not going to intervene in everything that happens in the course of events that say, hey, that James was an apostle. I'm not going to go down there and let him to be taken by the hand of Herod and excite the Jews and give them all kind of encouragement that they don't need to listen to the gospel, that it's not here for forever. God's not going to do that. And so when you look at God and how God does things, we look at him in the life today and we say, we think God ought to do this. And it doesn't turn out that way. And we have people in the world today and maybe sometimes even within the body of Christ who say, I just don't understand God. I don't think that's what, is God really real because he let this happen? Don't you think that's the kind of thing that they're questioning here? You let James die? Peter goes free? How does that seem fair to, to mankind? But God is working his purpose. And it was his purpose that this would happen or it was allowed to happen. And yet Peter was spared that. So the bolstering of the church uh, in, in every way through them speaking to each other about the, the miraculous things that are happening. Peter says, go tell James and the brethren. Uh, let them know about this. Let them be strengthened by what's going on. And then it says that Peter um, departed and went into another place. Uh, just makes sense. Peter doesn't need to be staying around here. Um, he's still going to probably be looked for. And we'll read on to see what happened with the Herod and the, the surprise that they're going to awake to. But Peter sees the need to move on to some other place away from them. Now, is it, uh, is it soon it was day? There was no small stir among the soldiers, which were... And what was become of Peter? Now, we're going to see this in the next verse or so. But if you know anything about Roman soldiers and the Romans' instructions and how their soldiers were uh, developed and the rules by which they conducted their 
affairs as it came to prisoners. We've had this discussed a number of times by different people that have taught classes or have mentioned it from the pulpit. What happens when a Roman soldier loses their soldier, their, sorry, their prisoner? It's death. It is death. It's not, oh, we're going to take you away over here because you've lost this, this prisoner. We're going to beat you with stripes and uh, you're going to wish you had not lost him, but uh, you've got your life still. No. If a Roman soldier lost a prisoner, it was death. And so when you wake up and remember the scenario that we talked about, where was Peter? Chained where? Between two soldiers. And there were two soldiers standing outside the door of where he was, and it was four quaternions, right? Of soldiers that were we've discussed that were throughout the prison for the specific purpose of keeping Peter in prison until Herod could do something with him. So you imagine, you wake up, it's morning. You look over there, the chains are laying on the floor. Where is Peter? When have they ever had a prisoner and just the chains fall off of them? Where's Peter? And then they're clamoring around. The guys outside of the, the door say, well, what's going on in there? Peter's gone. What? Peter? There's no way Peter's gone. We've been here the whole time. Can you imagine the uproar that's going on? What has happened to Peter? Verse 19. And when Peter had sought for him and found him not, and apparently Herod says, okay, bring Peter out here. We're going to take care of him. Remember, they didn't do anything to Peter because what? Why was he in prison instead of being taken and executed in the first place? No, there was something that was going on. What was the time frame for this? Passover. It was the time of unleavened bread. And he knows the Jewish people are feasting. You know, you're trying to keep these people pumped up. Hey, I'm taking care of these apostles and this Christianity and everything that's going on. And, uh, but it's unleavened bread that they're doing the Passover. That, you know, that's not the time to do it. So let's put Peter away, then we're going to bring him back. So now Herod says, okay, let's, let's bring Peter out. It's time to do something. Apparently the Passover's gone past. And so he sought for him and he found him not. He examined the keepers. What's happened here? What do you mean he's gone? How could he have gotten out of chains? How did he get passed through all of you and disappear out of the prison totally? How could this possibly happen? And he examined the keepers and he commanded that they should be put to death based on the way the Roman soldiers were taken care of. And obviously, even though his soldiers may not have been Roman soldiers, that's what Rome would have expected. And remember all this time that the governors had to give reports of what's going on. And they had to answer to Rome. They didn't just do what they wanted to do necessarily. They had to answer to Rome. And so they had to conduct their businesses like Rome would do it. And they would have demanded the death of these soldiers. So even though they may not have been Roman soldiers, they were under the same uh, military approach that uh, it would have been for, for Roman soldiers. And so he puts them to death. And then we see as we close verse 19, he, that's Peter, went down from Judea to Caesarea and there abode. We know he's moving off to somewhere else. Here we have the indication of where he's headed. Okay, so we're going to see some things happening here at the latter part of this verse that deal with Herod and uh, the type of person that Herod was. And once again, we're going to see the power of God that's acting uh, among the people. All right, next week we'll pick that up. Appreciate you being here and your, your participation this morning.